Good morning, everybody. This is Chris Jones with the University of Arizona Gila County Cooperative Extension, and we are here today for our Garden and Country Extension webinar. We've got the Payson Community Garden with us this week to talk about their gardening plans and how it assists all the rest of us because they know what they're doing, unlike the rest of us here. And uh, we've got Susan Miller Hoover with us to talk about a bug and disease free zone. That's definitely what we want for our gardens. So briefly here, a little bit about our uh, University of Arizona Cooperative Extension Garden Country Extension webinars. I present these weekly. I make them 60 minutes or less. They're Thursdays at 11. You all know that because you're here. Um, from so right now, we started back on February 11, planning this through April 15. I am hosting the spring gardening classes for the Payson Community Garden in Northern Gila County, Arizona. The recordings are posted at the Cooperative Extension YouTube channel. You can find that there. If you just kind of put that in there, you'll find this playlist and go to our Facebook pages, go to the Payson Community Garden website. We've been kind of working these uh, webinars into nice pieces that you can look at. Um, Michelle at the Payson Community Garden has been making these available. And the University of Arizona is an equal opportunity, affirmative action institution. Here's our agenda for today. Thank you for everybody who logged in early for that login and lag time. Um, I'm doing the welcome. My name is Chris Jones and the, I'm the moderator. Today's discussion is on the bug and disease-free zone with Susan Miller Hoover. She has about a half hour PowerPoint presentation she'll share with us. Put your questions and uh, into the chat, bo chat box and we will have a chat box discussion with Susan when she's finished and finish up at noon. Uh, we can ask us and if we've got more questions, we'll keep on going. We've got Susan here, so take advantage of it. Here is Susan Miller Hoover, the Payson Community Gardener. And this time I'm ready to hand it over to Susan. Welcome, Susan. Hi, oh, what is this? This will stop the other, okay. It's, what is, it's doing weird things. Uh-oh, here it comes. That's, yeah, there we go. Okay, can you see it now? Yes, it looks like okay. we're ready to go. All right. Um, thanks for showing up uh, to me talk about bugs and, and diseases in the garden. And a couple of things I want everybody to know is that the garden hours for April are Monday through Friday, 3 to 6 p.m. and all day Saturday, 8 to 4. So, and the purple lines are on so that you can bring your hoses and water what you are putting in the ground now. And as long as it doesn't freeze, those purple lines will stay on. Um, so come on out and join us. And then in May, we'll start adding um, morning hours. So my talk is about bugs and disease-free zones. And why do we want to have this discussion? Um, it's because there's always bugs. There's always something in your garden space. And some of them are beneficial and some of them are not. And in a home garden, you may not have as many bugs as what we see in our community garden. But that's because your garden is usually by itself. Nobody else has, has a garden bed in your yard. Whereas in the community garden, as you can see from this picture, our gardens are three feet apart. And so whatever might be in my garden absolutely wants to be in um, my neighbor's garden or vice versa. So. It's extremely important that we stay vigilant to get rid of the bad bugs and keep the good bugs where um, they can help us do bug control. 
So uh, what you'll see in the garden is we've got one gal, I call her the bug catcher lady, sorry, Carol. Um, and you'll see her going around with a jar of soapy water every time she's in the garden. And that's how she keeps ahead of the bugs. And if we just follow her example, um, we should have less bugs. So, Susan, yes, I'm going to ask for you to go ahead and turn off your camera. We've been having kind of a bandwidth issue and okay. make sure that, yeah, that, that you're like, I'll turn off my camera, darn. <laughs> but, darn. Well, yeah. um, but I think that will help with the, uh, so just down at that little icon there where the, the, the stop. Well, video. you're, yeah, you're missing from my screen completely now. But down in the bottom left, you should be able to get that line to come up where it says stop video. Yeah, it's not there anymore. Uh, -uh. oh, wait, wait, wait. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not. All right, I, I apologize. Move forward. No, 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 that's okay. okay. As soon as if I could find your face, then I could get you back on here. But my things aren't coming up so well. So okay. You're on full okay. screen. That's all. Yeah. Okay. So we're looking at the good bugs, which are the beneficial bugs that pollinate and hopefully target the bag bugs. Um, and then we're looking to identify the bad bugs um, that are non-beneficial, that destroy or sicken your plants, the ones you want to stay on top of. And then for my own thoughts, the ugly bugs, and I have designated the squash bugs and the tomato hornworms as my um, ugly bugs that I don't want to have um, anything to do with. So throughout this talk, you'll be seeing the actual pictures of the bugs. And we're just going to talk about what you can do to maintain them when they show up and um, how to move forward and have a So the first thing is prevention is the key. You want a clean garden. You don't want anything in your garden that the bugs can get underneath and lay their eggs or hide. So keep your garden clean. The next thing is to plant herbs or um, flowers in your garden, you'll see a lot of basil, you'll see um, marigolds, lots of people have garlic and onions, and a lot of people use that garlic as a perimeter crop to keep things away. Nasturtiums are really good. Everything on this list here has a smell or a taste or a something that the bugs don't like, and it will keep them from getting into your garden. So now we're going to talk about some beneficial bugs. One of the things that we are trying to recruit a lot of in our garden is the pollinators. And we have honeybees, we have orchard mason bees, and you can um, differentiate the bees from the flies and the wasps because the um, flies have two wings, bees have four wings, and flies are hairier than the, um, the wasps that we have. So we're really looking to try and get more mason bees in our garden. And the way we're doing this is you're going to see some of these bee houses um, around our garden. We have them up front in the uh, demo garden, and then several other gardeners have them throughout the garden. Some of them are high up and facing southwest. Some of them are almost down in the ground. So everybody has just put them in, and we're seeing 
more bees. So what this is, is just a piece of wood that has holes um, drilled out into it. And the bees will come and build their nest in there and then spread out across the ground. The garden and pollinate our plants. The reason that we want mason bees is because they not only are great pollinators, but they don't like human beings as well as um, the honeybees do. So we much rather have these gorgeous little mason bees buzzing around. The next really good um, beneficial bug is the ladybugs. And they're called lady beetles, ladybird beetles, ladybugs, and they are predatory insects. They're active from late spring into early fall, as long as the food is available. They will overwinter in your garden if you have a perennial that they can hide in. And some of our gardeners even bring more in each season and let them loose. So this is a picture of the ladybugs feeding on that artichoke. And you can see the ladybug larva on the left side. They primarily feed on aphids. So if they're scarce, if aphids are scarce, then the ladybugs will feed on any of the eggs of moths and other beetles and mites and small insects as long and pollen and um, nectar. So the thing about ladybugs is if there's nothing for them to feed on in your garden, they're not going to stay around. But we always seem to have a bunch in our in our garden so they're eating up some of our pesty bugs. There's one thing that you want to note is on the left is a ladybug, the bright red beetle with the black spots. That's a good bug. The one you don't want to mistake it for, and a lot of people do, is the Mexican bean beetle, which is orange with black spots. And the big difference, of course, is that the ladybug eats bugs and the bean beetle eats your plant. So if you see this guy, pull him off and get rid of him. This one I have a hard time with. I don't like spiders. And I've been told numerous times not to kill this spider in my garden. So I'm trying. But this spider is called the spider with the bright face. You can see the bright yellow colors and black on him. Um, they eat a variety of garden pests and they're active during the day. So when the bugs and aphids and things are out and about, they're out and about trying to catch them. So these are your good guys and you should try really hard to keep them in the garden because they're going to get rid of your flies, moths, wasps, mosquitoes, beetles, and, and grasshoppers. So I keep trying, but there are just some times that I do away with them, which is not a good thing. Next is praying mantis. And last year, one of our gardeners um, brought some praying mantis um, cocoons to our butterfly garden. So we had a few more of these around and they have enormous appetites for aphids, leafhoppers, mosquitoes, caterpillars, and any of the young soft bodied insects. So if you see these, um, count your blessings because you're gonna have fewer and fewer bugs. This little guy is a great pollinator, but he's also hiding um, a bad side, if you will. 
Um, he's a great big moth and he flies around your, your garden, but when he lays his eggs, he turns into the tomato hornworm. So what you have here is your adult moth that will lay that itty bitty small green seed or egg on the plant. And most of us are not going to see that in a tomato plant. The next thing we're gonna see is this ugly big tomato worm that has decimated our crops overnight. And so then once he eats his fill and he gets big enough, then he goes down to the ground and burrows in and becomes a pupa. And then in the spring, he comes out and becomes a mo the moth again. So in some stages, this is a beneficial insect that we want in the garden, but on the other hand, it could kill your crops. And we'll talk about it a little bit more when we get to the bad bugs. The other thing um, that I wanna share with you at plantfairnursery.com, they have a lot of information about good bugs and they have pictures of them so that um, you can go in and to the website, go to click about and how to and find those um, handouts. And then you'll know, you'll have a better idea of what you're looking for. The other thing that's gonna happen is we post around the garden, the different bugs that you should be looking out for. And the third way we're gonna help you identify bugs is that we have these little pop-ups, spotlights, where when we find the bug the first time in the garden, we're going to videotape it and get it out onto the YouTube channel so that you guys see what we're looking for on the actual plant. And then you can, you get in just in time information. So now let's talk about those bugs that we don't want want in our gardens. First one is aphids. Very colorful. They come in black, gray, red. They also, if you look at this middle slide here, you can see where the leaf is curled up. And if you see that on your plants and unroll it, this is what you're going to see is a bunch of aphids on here. Now, the aphids absolutely love diseased and um, past prime plants. So like this is a cabbage and it's past its prime. And so the aphids have gone to it. They really get into the coal crops and some of those kinds of things. So it's really, really important that when you have lettuce and kale and broccolis and those kinds of things that once it passes its prime and you've harvested the really good stuff, pull it. Don't just let it sit there or you're inviting these aphids. Now, if you wanna get rid of them um, and there's not a whole ton of them, a strong stream of water will wash them off. But if they are, um, infested, what we suggest is that you put a garbage bag over the entire plant, pull it out by its roots and go put it in the dumpster. By covering it with a garbage bag, you keep these little critters from escaping and going someplace else. So, and if you don't know what you've got, just ask one of the, your gardeners around you or one of the staff and we'll be glad to help you identify what it is that you have. This little guy is going to get your pota potatoes um, unless you're really diligent about um, picking them off and um, 
throwing them in soapy water or squishing them, whatever you want to do to keep them from growing. The first thing you're going to see is this adult um, potato beetle orangish reddish face with tan and then black stripes going back. These guys have overwintered in your garden down in the soil and they come up when they, your tomato plants or your potato plants start coming up. And if you can catch them at this stage, you're never going to get to the egg stage. So they eat and then you look on the bottom side of the leaf and you're going to see this big mass of yellow um, eggs. At this point, you, they're soft enough that you could just squish them all or I just take off the leaf and throw it in my bucket of soapy water and throw it out when I go. And these two require almost a daily looking for them. I was gone from my garden last year for about a week. And I thought I had cleaned all of these off because I didn't see that many. When I got back, I had this larva and not just one of them. I swear the whole plant was moving with them. And so I got rid of that plant, but then, you know, I had to diligently keep pulling these guys off or I would not have had any potatoes. So the best thing to do is when they first get there, pull, pull the adults off and don't get a, give them a chance to lay their eggs and then get rid of the eggs so that they don't have a chance to become the larva because the larva is where they decimate your plant in a very, very short time. And an interesting fact, just so you know how prolific these are, a female can lay 500 or more eggs over a four to five week period. So you really don't want that many larvae running around. Um, so it's really important um, to get these eggs out of there and they hatch about eight or nine days after they are laid. So you have a little bit of time to find them, but I can't always find them. And I don't think anybody else in the um, garden finds them all. But if you catch them in the adult stage, um, you can limit what's coming behind. Now these little guys, I absolutely hate and I think they are the worst thing that was ever put upon this earth. They're the squash bugs. And again, they live in the ground beneath your plants and they come up in the spring. And the first thing, of course, you're going to see is this ugly bug. And the next thing is you're going to see two mating. So um, if you can pick them off and put them in water or squish them, when you see them before they can lay their eggs, um, you're going to be much better off. But this is where you have to be really, really diligent. And these little guys like to hide. So if you don't see them in the morning, just turn on the water and water around the base of your squash plant and you will see them come out of the ground um, and scurry around. They're quite quick, so be on your best bug catching game when you are um, going after them. Once they mate, then they will do lay these eggs underneath the leaves. And these are a little bit harder um, eggs to squish. So what we found works really, really good is getting a piece of duct tape and pulling them off that way. Um, works really well and you don't have to worry about these hatching because when they hatch, they look like this. See these right here, they look like spiders. These are newly, newly hatched um, squash bugs. And then these over here that have the gray on them, they are a little bit younger and these travel in packs. And you will, I looked one time 
and didn't see any. And one of my neighboring gardeners came up to me and said, Susan, do you know that your squash leaf is completely gray? And I got back over there and you couldn't even see the green on my leaf of the squash. There was so many uh, newly hatched ones. So again, if you don't wanna look at this in your garden and have them tear your plants apart, you wanna catch them when they're this size. And the more we can get rid of them at this stage, then we don't have the eggs. And there's not a lot of stuff that um, will kill the eggs. We found a couple of products um, that actually will get into the eggs and kill them and is organic. But the, the best way is just getting in and killing the adult um, bugs. The next thing is trying to prevent them. And as Carol told you last week in the vertical growing um, video, you need to get your squash plants off the ground so that there are no leaves laying on the ground that they can hide under. Um, so stake your plants up, put them in a, a you know, a tomato cage or something just to get them off the ground so that these guys can't get underneath there. And ah, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, well, but get them here. Keep your garden clean. Keep your leaves off the ground and get rid of the egg mass to prevent getting these things so and then there's the cabbage worm looper that starts out this itty bitty thing over here and i'm never going to see that on a on a plant um, didn't know that i was looking for that until i did this video or this presentation but this is what he looks like when he's full grown and they grow to about an inch in length and they're this fluorescent green. And you can pick them off as you see them to prevent getting these holes in your cabbage or to prevent them, um, cover your crop with a um, floating row cover and then they can't get in and get to your leaves. Yeah. They like dirty gardens, so keep your garden as clean as you possibly can. These are harlequin bugs, the adults and the larva. And one thing about these guys is they like past prime coal crops. And that's probably where you're going to see them the most. And so, I think you're hearing the same thread all the way through this. If you see the adult bugs, pick them off and don't let them get to the larval stage. And so any diseased plants, any plants that are past their prime, this is where you're going to see these bright orange bugs with black in them. And so, and the larvae have the white and black. So you really want to find them at this stage and pick them off. This little guy is the bane of all tomato growers. Because first of all, you can't see this beet leaf hopper very well. He's only 0.12 inch or three millimeters in length. Look at his pale green color and a little bit of dark markings. Um, most of us don't even see that they're there. If you have an infestation, of course, and you're shaking your tomato plant to make it pollinate and a whole bunch of these fly off, then you know you've got an infestation. You probably ought to take that plant out right then and there. What these beef leaf hoppers bring is curly top 
virus. And once your plant gets curly top virus, it will not set any plants, it will not pollinate any plants. And so you just need to get it out of your garden. So if you look at this, you can see that the leaves are curling. You can see that they're not really um, wilting. They look like have healthy wheat leaves in some ways. But the real telltale sign is along the back here, all these veins will be purple. So if you see this, um, sometimes what we tell you to do is it looks like maybe it's dried out a little bit. It may need a little bit of water. Um, so we'll tell you to go ahead and water it really good. But if it stays this way, we're going to come around and help you um, know that it needs to be pulled out. Um, so what happens is the beet leaf hopper goes into these diseased plants and gets the disease and then they don't necessarily like to eat tomato plants they just get on them and bite into them taste it don't like it but at that's all it takes and now your plant if they had curly leaf virus on them now your plant has that um so the one thing to really know is there's there's no cure for this and there is no such thing as a tomato plant variety that has been um, hybrided to defeat this disease. So we need to prevent it. And the way to prevent it is as soon as you put those tomato plants in the ground, and you put your tomato cage around, you're going to want to cover your tomato um, cages and plants. So you don't want any openings that any of the bugs can get through. This is tool and the bugs can't get through the small diameter of the openings in the tool. The tool will stay on until August, until you begin, um, harvesting. One thing that's really important that new beginners always forget, and sometimes the older ones, is that your tomato plant is not always going to be small. So if you notice here, there's extra fabric left around so that as this tomato grows up and out and around that you're not strangling your plant. And so if if you leave this extra um, material on there, just make sure you fluff it out as your plant is growing so that your plant can be happy and keep growing the way it is. And you always know it's tomato season because the gardeners break out every color of tool imaginable. And just so you know, a bolt of tool. 54 inches by 40 yards is about 10 bucks on, um, on Amazon. And they have all different kinds of colors. I had a dark blue last year. I've seen red. There's plenty of white going around. But we have a very colorful garden when, when we start doing this. If you have, if you recognize that you have curly top, um, then the only thing that you can do about it is cover it with a garbage bag and throw it in the trash. Anything that has bugs on it or that has disease on it, we don't want in the com compost pile. So make sure you get it thrown in the trash. And you don't have to worry if you don't think you would recognize Curly Top. Um, we have a group of our staff members that once a week when it's the bugs start coming out and uh, we go through and we check each garden because we know that gardeners can't be out there every day and if we see something we'll let you know most of the time we'll watch for you come into the
the garden and we'll just come over and say, hey, you know, you've got squash bugs. Look, let me show you. And here's what we do with them and that kind of stuff. Or no, that's not curly top, just watered a little bit more. So we do go around the garden looking for bugs and um, we'll help you um, determine what you need to do with your plant um, to get rid of them and that kind of stuff. So just uh, know that we'll out there be in your eyes when you can't be there. So we talked about what causes this tomato hornworm or this guy over here. And he's really colorful with yellow and red spots or black spots. Um, and the tobacco hornworms that you get the same are not as, uh, as colorful. These guys can grow to be three or four inches long. They're squishy, they're, uh, ugh, I just can't stand them. And this is what you're gonna see. See how he's decimated these leaves? on the, the branches here. And you'll come in in the morning and this is what you'll see. And you'll know that you've got a, a hornworm there. And you need to look underneath the leaves really, really good because they camouflage um, easily. When it gets warm, they go into the middle of your plant. They don't stay on top of your plant. And so we have, um, one of our staff started a black light um, night and we go out in the late evening with black lights and these guys fluoresce so that we can pull them off. Last year we were pretty good. Um, we only had a couple of guys that had the tomato hornworms and when we did our black light, um, we only found three. So that was a lot better than the year before. But I think what was good about it is that the tool covering your tomato plants keeps that moth from laying its eggs on your tomato plants. So you are stopping that life cycle right at the very beginning, getting rid of the, um, not getting rid of the adult, but preventing the leg laying. If you get, um, these, all you can do is pick them off. I tend to cut the branch below them and throw them over the fence for the birds to eat. Um, they also, some people will put BT spray on their tomato plants as a pre preventative. But um, again, the best way is prevent prevention, keeping the tool on your plants, and then picking these guys off if you see them. And we're always on the lookout for new bugs that come in. And last year, we were surprised by this thing called a flea beetle. And you can see he's He's green and shiny, or he can have yellow stripes, or he can be not so shiny. But they got their names because just like fleas, as soon as they sense danger, they jump out of the way. So these guys hide in your garden over winter. Where we think we got ours, perhaps, is we keep wood chips in the aisles around our gardens to discourage weed growth. And we had quite a bit of um, wood chips delivered last year. And we think that's probably where they came from because they usually harbor in trees and tree bark because we had never had them before. And these are the plants that they absolutely love to um, get into. They also like various flowers. One gal had a, a bunch of alyssums and they were just totally devastated and gone. So these guys um, 
become active in the spring. So when it's about 50 degrees con um, continuously, they start to become active. And what they do is um, they will lay eggs at the bottom of your plants. And so the larvae come out two to three weeks after the legs, eggs are um, laid and they attack your roots. Then there's a one week pupil stage and then there are the adults. And the adults attack the plant leaves. So what happens is you look like your plant leaf has been shot with a shotgun shell. There's just all these little holes in it. And if it's a mature plant, it's not going to hurt it. But your new seedlings um, are not strong enough to um, fight off this, this bug. So one of the things um, that we can do is for instance, this is about the time of year that these are going to be hatching. And so if you can delay your um, planting, if you wanted to plant this week, delay it for a couple of weeks because that way the um, larva will hatch, but they won't have anything to eat. And after that two to three week period, um, then they're not going to turn into the adult or um, stage to attack your leaves. And we have had not luck um, finding something that gets rid of these, these beetles that is organic. You can put out um, sticky tape at the base of all your, your plants if you see them and they'll get stuck in the um, sticky tape and you can throw them away. Um, the other thing is um, if, if they're eating your plant, you might as well just pull it up if it's a young one and get rid of it. But one thing you can do is leave one of those plants that's being eaten as your um, oh I don't know what I want to call it um, so that the bugs are attracted to that and will continue to eat there and not spread to your rest of your garden so you could leave a, a beet in the ground or a broccoli and just let them use that one to eat while you wait to plant plant your others so um, I don't know what our year is going to look like this year. We have several gardeners who planted in the winter and have um, crops coming up already underneath their covers. So we'll just have to see um, if these guys come back, but they weren't all over the garden. They were just in certain places. So hopefully, um, we won't have as many as we did last year. So in summary, keep your garden clean of debris. Um, if you have sickly looking plants, get rid of them um, and do whatever you need to do to keep your plants healthy, getting them off the ground, getting them lots of air watering them properly and begin recognizing your beneficial versus the non-beneficial bugs and manually removing every bug that you see and their eggs as you find them. And finally, if none of that works, um, let's try or pest controls, but before you bring something like that into the garden, um, make sure that it has the Omri sill on it or that you've talked to Glenn over at um, Plant Nursery to make sure that it's organic or find one of the staff 
and the staff is always going to be around and help you recognize the bugs. And again, we'll be sending out notifications when we see them. And uh, so hopefully we can help you recognize and get a handle on the bugs before they get out of out of control. Questions? All right. Well, thank you very much, Susan. Mm -hmm. I can get my camera up here. You can try to bring yours up. Um, lots to cover there. I'm glad you started with some of our, the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? Mm, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But that's how insects and diseases are. You know, there's just so many of them and they're all specific. So lots for gardeners to know about. Let's jump into our question and answer here. I'm going to start in the chat box here and in a little bit we'll switch over to this question Q&A. But Stephanie Lambert just made a comment that um, praying mantis are indiscriminate and will eat good bugs and bad bugs. So watch out for that. I think I remember seeing some video of a praying mantis try to catch up a hummingbird. So oh my. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, um, and Cindy, I believe, commented that roadrunners will dig into the soil to ferret out tomato horn worm pupae. Ah. Good meal. Yeah, I think roadrunners, a lot of the birds and others will look, you know, I, I get the curve build thrasher in my backyard and I think they'll, they're good at picking out pupae and those brown ones also. Well, when we, turn over the garden, we're always on the lookout for those ugly looking things when we take them out and squish yeah. them and throw them away, you know. So, find, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say our mantra is find and squish, I think. <laughs> <Fine>. <laughs> yeah. okay. And Cheryl's asking around when do the Colorado potato beetles come out of their overwintering? Um. I usually see them after my t potato plants um, are about three to four inches tall. So, and I found them first last year on some um, volunteer potatoes that came up. So they came up in the very early, early spring. So. Okay, so as soon as you start seeing those potato leaves come up, that's when you'll start seeing potato mm -hmm. leaves. All right, Teresa asks, how do you get rid of the newly hatched squash bugs? That's what you're trying to avoid. So. <laughs> um, ah, tape works really well um, to put it around your hand with the sticky side out and put um, and grab them that way. Um, it's probably the best way to do it unless you're going to use um, a spray. And the spray we use is Endol and it kills the eggs too, but it immediately kills those um, new hatchlings. But hopefully you're going to get rid of them before they get to that stage. Right, because I can imagine those hatchlings are fast and they get down to the soil and they're hard to catch. So. <sighs> The best yes. way to do it, it to get those newly hatched squash bugs is before they're hatched, right? Mm -hmm. and exactly. You're using that tape and it pulls it right off the leaves. Is that right? That's right. So, so you just wrap it around your hand with the sticky side out and just start going up whenever you see any eggs. It takes the eggs right off. And then if they miss some, it'll take the young ones off too. Okay. And Jerry asks, are there any fungus gnat problems at the community garden? Uh, I don't believe so, but I'm sure there's other staff members um, watching this that might know. Um, I haven't seen any. Yeah, and I'm not, I think fungus gnats tend to be more of an indoor plant problem because they're indoors and then they get in your face. Um, Whereas outside, they have some place to go and they eat the fungus in the ground rather than your plants. So um, so I don't think you notice them as an outdoor issue as much as you notice them indoors. 
uh, Kathleen asks, says, I thought the sphinx moth was the hornworm. And so let me to mention to Kathleen that we have several species of large moths like that. And so the sphinx moth, the five line moth, um, the hummingbird moth, they aren't all the same as the tobacco hornworm and the tomato hornworm. We have several native ones too, such as the, there's one that feeds on that datura. Um, and, and, and so that, that might be a fun program if I can get a specialist to come in and kind of about the myths or monsters with these big moths, because some of them are problems and some of them are just natives. Do you, do you have anything on that? No. Okay. So. She also mentions which of those bugs cited have not been observed at the Payson Community Garden. I haven't noticed some of those, such as the bean beetle. I think you've had them off and on. Is that right, Susan? Yeah, the Mexican bean beetle, I'm not sure that we have had or I haven't seen in my, this will be my fourth year there. Um, I put that in just because it looks like a um okay. ladybug and but all the rest of them have been there at some time or the other and our biggest bane is um the squash bugs right and you know the tomato hornworms come and go some years we have good ones sometimes we don't and the um beet hop leaf hopper um is a problem just because you can't see it and it doesn't attack every tomato, one here, one there, you know. So those we always see. And if you're trying to grow any type of uh, heirloom tomatoes, you've got some great things there with covering it with that tool and mm -hmm. yeah, because they would definitely be very susceptible. Um, yeah, and the other thing I noticed with that picture of your bean beetle, uh -huh. it had some real shoulders on it. And I don't know if that makes sense, but you know, just there is a bulging around its head that just mm -hmm. shoulders, whereas a uh, the lady beetle, it seems to be smoother. And, yeah. and so that might be something to look out for because sometimes those lady beetles have some difference in their colors too. Mm -hmm. Donna okay. says, how big are the holes in the Mason B boards? Um, I want to say they're about, I've got skinny fingers. I'm going to say my little finger, between my little finger and my ring finger size. Carol, are you out there? You've got one of those. Do you remember how big your the holes are? Everybody who anybody who makes those, tell us, let us know which which drill bit you're using. Is it? Yeah, Carol. Carol raised her okay. hand. Can you? Oh, let's see if I can get to it here. I've got a Carol for allow to talk so you can unmute yourself, Carol. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. It's about less than a quarter inch diameter on those uh, tubes. Less than a quarter inch. Yep. So get those fine ones and keep going a little bit smaller. What we got. Okay. Thank you, Carol. You're welcome. Okay. We'll. Uh... Remove permission here. Okay. More questions coming along. Uh, okay, I'm not too sure we can help you out with this, Linda. She says, I have tiny black flying insects that look like ants in the pear tree flowers. Are those harmful? If they're in the flowers of the pear tree, they're probably bee insect. Um, pollinators. What do you think, Susan? I would think so. Kathy, you know more about trees. Are you on? Yeah, well, because you know. just by, by their behavior, Linda, they're in the pea, they're in the blossoms. Mm -hmm. They look like an ant, which would be, might look, might be a type of fly and probably not harmful. Mm -hmm. And the word you were looking for was trap crop. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, brain fade happens all the time. Uh, uh, Myra says, we have a small community garden that is considered 
considering not allowing squash plants because of past infestations. We have had straw bales in the past, which are now gone. Do you think a year without squash plants will make a big difference in the following, in the following year? And she's got several questions here, but I mean, let me just finish it up here. Do you have people in the garden who are patrolling for the, for the problems? If so, how are the answers? She said you answered that question about patrolling for them and mm -hmm. the issues. But um, first, I'm going to say, Myra, that if it was just a uh, homeowner and they've got squash bug problems like the ones they had at the Payson Garden several a few years back, I would definitely say give it a year's rest. Um, but but they didn't have to at the garden. A lot of people were able to grow different varieties and take more precautionary care of their squash plants and continue to have a good crop last year. So mm -hmm. what comments do you have on that, Susan? Well, we did. There's been some conversation about squash plants and not having them because of the squash bugs. But I think as long as you're diligent, those people that got out there and picked those bugs didn't have any problem. One of my gardeners um, that's near my garden, he didn't pay any attention to the fact that he had these adult bugs or squash bugs running around. And before you knew it, he had such an infestation that there was no way that he could could even control them, you know, and so they go back down into your garden and over winter. So you're you're really better off to control the adult population and then they can't lay more eggs or get a new um, population started. Yeah, so so if Myra's community can live a year without squash, <laughs> uh, I would think it's worth an effort. Yes. Okay. Um, Margaret comments, curly top virus is not tr transmitted in the soil, so you can replant with another tomato plant if it is early enough in the season to obtain the fruit production. So good advice there. Thanks, Margaret. Yeah, that, that curly top virus, it was just like Susan was saying, it isn't even that the beet leaf hopper likes tomatoes, it just comes and, check and checks them out. It, it's a vector, so it just leaves it in the plant. And as Susan said, as soon as it is infected, it won't pollinate like it should, it won't produce fruit like it should. So it'll stay alive. You can keep it alive all summer long and not have any fruit. So you just got to pull them out and start over like Margaret said, right? <laughs> right, Susan? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to pull them out. It's like, but there's something there. But you really oh, you, you really want to cry when you're pulling them out. When somebody, the first time somebody came over to me, Kathy came over to me and in my first year and she told me that I had curly top and I hadn't a clue what it was. And she told me I had to pull it out. I wanted to argue with her so bad, but she knew what she was talking about and convinced me to pull it out. So now I, now I know. And now our audience knows it's hard yes. to pull them out, but you just are wasting a lot of energy keeping that plant if it has the curly top virus. Okay. Um, a cup, when you hit flea, the flea beetles seem to have hit a, a, a nerve here, Susan. Uh-oh. Susan says, I've squished, see, I've already seen flea beetles and squished them. They seem to be brand new from last year. They're really annoying. And <laughs> Valerie says, I had flea beetles annihilate her gara. Mm. Never seen them before. Never saw other plants affected. Suspect it came with the gara. Hmm. Mm. So that and gar is a flower that people don't. Yeah, know. it's they are they are nasty. I mean, we somebody found one and showed it to me and said, "What in the world?" You know, and I went and looked it up, and you know, we had never had them, and nobody in the garden had seen them. So I'm hoping that you know we've controlled them enough last year that maybe we're not going to have a big infestation this year because. They just don't go away and they're quick little buggers. They're quick little buggers. Susan, we are up on the hour. I'm going to go ahead and do a, uh, a, a goodbye.
we're going to we're going to people stay online because we're going to go ahead and keep answering your questions. But I'm going to close this down so that we can have a one hour video for the recording, and I'm just going to do that right now. Bring up my slideshow. So we've just had Susan Miller with us here, telling us about uh, bugs, and we have a great conversation going on. So thank you very much, Susan. You're very welcome. We have enjoyed our discussion and just want to let people know that next week we'll be back with uh, more on our Pacing Community Garden se session. Uh, April 8th, uh, our speaker will be Bill Peterly. So if you haven't heard from Bill, everybody knows him at the garden because he's always helping people with everything. And he's going to give some more about watering your garden. And so Thank you, everybody, for being with us today. Uh, we'll see you next week. Have a great day.